All right, I think we're good. Andre, sorry. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I'll try. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, how, how would I do that? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, so <clears throat> I apologize. I have a cold today, so your experience will not be uniform throughout the talk listening to me. <clears throat> Um, so I'm Andre Lapitz. I'm a, a computer science faculty at Boston University, um, and I also direct uh, the Software and Application Innovation Lab. I'm also involved in something called the Hariri Institute. So I'll tell you about some of these. I assume that <clears throat> one of the reasons I was invited here, as, as Hugh mentioned, was to uh, kind of introduce BU and, and what's happening at BU uh, to everyone. Uh, now I should make the disclaimer that this isn't, uh, this is nowhere near everything that's happening at BU. This is just things that we're involved in or that I've been involved involved in um, or that I'm peripheral to that I'm aware of um, but hopefully it'll give everyone an idea of the kinds of things that are happening at BU that are um, uh, related or would benefit from open source or where open source is kind of incipient uh, in certain communities um, so it's just an overview first I'll talk about the Hariri Institute and the software and application innovation lab and then uh, I'll, I'll go over a couple of examples of work going on at BU that um, uh, you know involves open source or is starting to involve open source uh, that again we're involved in. And I'll talk a little bit about um, sort of the challenges and advantages and, and so on of, um, of trying to bring open source as well as bring software engineering into an academic uh, environment. Um, uh, in the way that we are uh, currently doing it. Um, so <clears throat> the Hurry Institute for Computing was founded about uh, six years ago now uh, to help uh, researchers across Boston University who have a software engineering, computer science, data science, uh, computational component to their research, all the way from you know, biologists and physis physicists all the way down to even you know, School of Theology, and, and we do work with School of Theology and, and uh, the humanities and things like that. Um, and the Hurry Institute supports uh, these kinds of uh, efforts through seed grants, through recognition of faculty and graduate students, through fellowships, um, but it also is uh, hosts sort of a federation of different centers, labs, and initiatives. Um, some of them it incubates, some of them it sort of uh, took on uh, after it was formed, um, and many of these are around specific topic areas like artificial intelligence. Others are uh, meant to promote things like you know digital education or software engineering in the case of the Software and Application Innovation Lab, um, uh, as well as uh, other uh, uh, other sort of uh, areas of uh, interest or focus. <clears throat> so um, software engineering within an, an academic environment is something that um, it seems is, is starting to become recognized as a, po as a possible career uh, in a way that it wasn't before. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about here is, you know, the standard career tracks involve, you know, you become a, uh, you become a PhD student, then you become a postdoc, then you become a faculty member, and, and uh, those kinds of uh, tracks in academia are well recognized and, you know, there's, um, uh, you know, broad... Uh, uh, you know, broadly well-organized uh, structures for people to progress through those throughout their career. Um, not so much for research software engineering yet, although you can, if you look online, you can see that these things are starting to improve. You have uh, in the United Kingdom, for example, you, you, you have these sort of trade groups and associations and conferences for research software engineers who actually want to build a career doing software engineering and uh, bringing best practices from software engineering into the academic environment. Um, and you have other examples in the United States where, uh, for example, the Flatiron uh, Institute, I think it's called, was founded in New York City uh, to help uh, researchers uh, with sort of computational challenges, um, and it was, you know it's a very large uh, sort of well-funded uh, group. So things are starting uh, to happen, and we're basically trying to do that um, uh, at Boston University. So about three years ago, um, uh, with this goal in mind, we started the Software and Application Innovation Lab at Boston University, and the idea here was to augment what the institute was doing in helping uh, researchers and faculty members and uh, and students introduce computational uh, and software engineering uh, elements into their research. Um, we grew very rapidly just because there's a lot of demand for this kind of thing. So initially it was pr primarily to support the seed grants where the Hariri Institute was supporting these kinds of efforts. Uh, but it turned out there's a lot of researchers who have funding, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, who have funding from external uh, uh, funding sources where, where academics typically get the bulk of their funding. So these are national uh, organizations like the National Institutes of Health or the National Science Foundation, as well as uh, foundations and, and other sources. 
um, DARPA, IARPA, uh, and so on. Um, so, uh, and, and you know, in, in this case, uh, what was very interesting is that um, it also allowed us to take um, existing research efforts that maybe weren't able to get funding from those sources because those organizations themselves are starting to recognize that you need to actually um, uh, support software engineering as uh, an end in, in of itself in many fields if you're going to actually uh, you know, improve those communities. And you'll see some examples of that. Uh, improve the way those communities work together and the way they build tools and so on. Um, so basically, um, because the Haruri Institute is kind of a hub at the university and talks to researchers uh, all around about the research they're planning to do or the research they're, they're currently doing, um, then uh, it really puts the institute in a good position to promote things like uh, open source approaches. So it, it's true that we've observed in many cases uh, over the past several years uh, situations where you know outside contractors were being hired and basically they were rebuilding the same thing over and over again. Uh, in some cases, what you you might arguably uh, say is a, is a waste of federal funding. Um, but it's simply because people weren't familiar with the fact that you can actually take a piece of software and separate it into an open source component, uh, which is reusable, and you can probably reuse it not only just within one group or within one project, but probably across projects. Um, but also that uh, you can take your proprietary research or whatever it is that you're building, and you can, you can uh, sort of isolate it so that it becomes a configuration or an instantiation or a parameter to that open source platform. So you can still have your your IP, uh, but but you'd be able to build this kind of uh, uh, infrastructure that's reusable. And it also puts us in a good position to promote best practices. So, you know, documenting your uh, your code. We've uh, had experiences where we had to rebuild things from screenshots um, uh, uh, using CI CD, making sure that you, um, you know, uh, use good uh, uh, version control and things like that. So these are things that we're able to promote um, and actually, you know, teach people about um, uh, throughout the BU community uh, because of the position that we're in, uh, because we're working with so many groups and talking to so many groups. Um, one thing that I will say, though, is um, uh, a lot of the things that I'll talk about and that we do are application level uh, development. So um, there are many groups, and you'll hear from, from other groups at BU who do uh, other kinds of work, but we specifically uh, focus on uh, sort of applications and, and things at the application layer. So frameworks, libraries, web services, full stack applications, and so on. Um, we have, uh, uh, you know, I'll mention some things that that also were production quality. So we've built things that are production quality and had to be deployed. Other things are more kind of uh, prototypes or things that are facing uh, users who happen to be researchers. So I'll go over some four, these four topic areas that I chose uh, where it's, it's, it's exciting to see sort of open source approaches being adopted. Um, so one of them is actually experimental design and automation in synthetic biology. So synthetic biology, it's kind of a, you know, there's lots of things going on there, but uh, sort of one prototypical uh, uh, workflow that um, uh, I'll focus on that there's some projects um, uh, that our, our funding work on um, is this idea of, you know, if I'm going to build uh, these genetic components that essentially implement logical uh, you know, programmatic uh, kinds of algorithms, and I'm going to, uh, you know, explore different designs to see which ones actually have the behavior that I want. So, an example application of this is something like I want to create some kind of organism that will organism that will detect um, uh, contaminants in water uh, by, you know, maybe glowing or uh, or something like that. Um, so, in order, so you can actually online right now buy a kit to do genetic engineering. You can do it at home. Uh, you just, you know, you just need to order one online. Uh, so, these the kinds of things exist, but here we're talking about sort of uh, automating this on a mass scale. Um, so basically what you're going from is a design to hopefully some kind of automated uh, infrastructure uh, APIs, you know, all the way down to machines that are actually going to run the experiments and, and uh, synthesize uh, biological components that have certain functionalities. Um, so what's really interesting is that, for example, DARPA is actually funding an effort called Synergistic D Discovery and Design, um, uh, which is, uh, um, uh, BU is involved in actually a broader group that, that includes the Broad Institute at MIT and others, um, and Doug Densmore is one of the PIs here at BU who, who uh, does this work. Um, but this program is actually explicitly designed to say, all right, all of you labs um, uh, that are uh, sort of doing synthetic biology and are planning to uh, create you know, pipelines that build these components that are essentially biological systems that perform certain functions, um, you, you guys need to agree on standards uh, that you're going to use. Uh, what kind of APIs are you going to use? What kind of formats are you going to use for describing an experiment, for describing a biological component, and so on? Um, and it's actually really interesting to see 
you know, they're actually doing things uh, in, in the way that you would expect um, and in, in the way that we see other open source communities doing things. You know, they have consortia, they have um, working groups, they put together standards, um, and, uh, you know, uh, DARPA is actually funding this kind of thing explicitly and encouraging this kind of work. Um, so specifically, for example, something we've been involved in is... Uh, is a number of different tools within workflows where we've contributed to existing um, uh, uh, standards as well as uh, existing tools within the community. Um, when you need to, for example, build these biological components, there's a standard uh, language for visualizing these, and it's amazing to see the, the you know the synthetic biologists actually on a whiteboard write it uh, so fluently as if they're just writing in English or something like that. Um, but uh, these sorts of um, uh, images are actually rendered uh, in various tools um, so that you can actually you know present them or, or examine them and things like that. So we've had contributions uh, where we've added, you know, uh, the ability to visualize additional kinds of components uh, within tools like Visible. Um, we've also contributed to uh, several tools for essentially uh, generating design. So if I want to have some kind of logical circuit um, and I want to implement it as a, uh, you know, some kind of biological system, uh, there's tools like Cello uh, that are being worked on, uh, including by, by groups at BU that I mentioned, um, that essentially take that logical circuit and uh, generate a bunch of biological designs that uh, could implement that circuit. And then, of course, you need to test and, and see if they work. And that's part of what this sort of experimental workflow is, uh, is meant to support. Um, uh, another standard standard that's kind of growing right now is SBOL. So this is a standard for, you know, it could be for describing uh, biological components. It could be for describing experiments. Um, and uh, it's, it's an RDF-based kind of XML format. Um, and it's actually expanding right now as the community decides what kinds of features should be added to it to describe the kinds of biological uh, components that they uh, they want to build. Um, one thing that I was really happy and impressed by was this um, uh, uh, open source protocol called Outer Protocol, uh, which is uh, intended primarily for robots. So essentially, these are uh, these pipette robots that I had a picture of here earlier on the on the right side. Um, and basically, the idea is that uh, you, you know you'd have this JSON format for you know saying take this pipette, move this much of this material into this particular well, um, and it's a programmatic way to describe this kind of process. But it's very interesting if you go to autoprotocol.org, um, uh, you'll see that um, it just looks like an API. And uh, you know you, this community has actually done a great job of taking uh, the kinds of techniques that we're familiar with from software engineering and adapting it to this uh, particular domain. It's very you know it's very encouraging to see that, and it's very refreshing to use this kind of tool um, and, and use this kind of format when you're building uh, uh, pieces of software. So that's one area where um, it's, it's definitely exciting to see these kinds of software engineering and open source techniques uh, uh, being introduced, and we're very happy that we have the opportunity to contribute to these um, uh, here at BU uh, within the uh, Software and Application Innovation Lab and, and for the Hurry Institute to be able to support this kind of work as well. Um, so there's another area where uh, we, we're seeing things change and kind of emerge right now called digital and electronic health. And um, the Hurry Institute, as well as some other groups like the Institute for Health Sci Science Innovation Policy, as well as the uh, Mobile and Electronic Health uh, Affinity Research Collaborative. These are some of the entities at BU that support uh, or are kind of encouraging some of these uh, things to happen. Uh, but here I have an example of uh, a sort of a series of projects that we're doing with, uh, with some of the faculty members at School of Public Health um, in building something called computerized adaptive testing platforms. So these are platforms that uh, basically allow um, uh, you know, organizations like healthcare providers, hospitals, uh, nonprofits uh, to provide a uh, that either could be administered by clinicians or can be sort of self-administered by uh, patients and users to assess their progress if they have, for example, a spinal cord injury or if they have a burn injury uh, or if they have other conditions or, or maybe just uh, sort of uh, uh, how they're progressing um, and what their condition is if they're healthy. Um, and uh, these tools actually, you know, uh, when we came into this community, many of them were being built uh, using, you know, Visual Basic 5 and they were running on Windows uh, uh, XP desktops and things like that. Um, it was very interesting to come into this community and, and try to introduce sort of full stack web applications using open source uh, frameworks uh, to build uh, both the back end and the front end uh, components and to also make them as a result uh, cross platform more compatible with uh, sort of web based uh, environments. And uh, and now we've actually um, you know had great experiences you know you know taking some of these. Um, 
uh, organizations on the right hand side uh, and helping them deploy these tools uh, using using modern techniques. So we're you know we're using Docker, giving them giving them these Docker images, allowing them to to set this up within their environment, um, and it's uh, it's really been great to do that. And one of the interesting things that we've run into here is actually um, a lot of these uh, tools have to be accessible uh, in the sense of uh, you know if. Um, uh, if you have users who may be um, uh, hearing or, or sight impaired and they need to be able to use these uh, websites nevertheless um, and one of the things that we've had to, we've actually run into is um, there is a, a government uh, I guess funded uh, framework uh, called assets that really isn't maintained very well um, and we've ended up actually having to use one with a not not so great license called accessible plus uh, for some of these tools, but we're actually thinking about right now um, coming up with sort of taking assets and maybe fixing it up ourselves here at BU, uh, given the number of projects that could benefit from this. But the idea here is that this is a, a front-end framework that um, uh, allows you to introduce uh, components into your web application, into your website that makes it accessible uh, in accordance with standards like Section 508. Um, so uh, this uh, this is something where, you know, th there's a lot of opportunity here for also for private organizations as well as uh, Nonprofits and, and academic actors to get in and uh, sort of improve this and um, uh, maybe contribute uh, in places where, for example, the, the government may not have the resources to, to maintain these things. I have here a Web Experience Toolkit, which is actually a Canadian government funded uh, project as well, just for, for complete coverage. But these are examples of uh, things where open source is actually, um, you know, open source approaches are also going to be very valuable. Um, obviously, this is something that benefits uh, many users and is essential uh, for many of these applications. And, uh, uh, this is where those techniques can uh, provide lots of benefits. <clears throat> So here within BU, um, uh, there's another project that we're working on where it was just, you know, showed us how important it is to use good software engineering practices. Um, so uh, Margaret Betke is actually um, uh, on, on top here. She's um, a faculty member within the CS department, and she's working with another faculty member in uh, the College of Health and Rehabilita Rehabilitation Sciences here at BU uh, to build this system that uses, well, it'll be other things because the Connect is discontinued, but at the, at, the, at the moment we're using a Microsoft Connect to essentially allow patients uh, to um, adhere to exercises, uh, to, for example, physical therapy exercises that they have to do at home. Um, and one thing that's interesting about projects like this is they really are, you know, heavy software engineering projects. You know, there's a team of 20 people with PhD students and software engineers and project managers all trying to, uh, you know, collect requirements, uh, build mock-ups, put together user interfaces, put together the back end, take components that are research components. You know, these are things that are algorithms that PhD students are putting together for their theses um, and getting and, and helping the PhD students uh, get them to the point where they're production quality so you can actually have patients using this and not being frustrated. Um, and there's a lot of project management that goes into this kind of work. There's a lot of uh, coordination and um, and in this case, you know, we, we're also using open source approach, approaches as well as using open source frameworks. Um, so it's a really great opportunity uh, for uh, uh, sort of demonstrating how valuable it is to, to use these approaches for these kinds of projects that probably wouldn't uh, uh, have made it this far uh, without sort of using uh, sort of industry and community best practices um, for, for something this complicated. So that's another um, ongoing project that's happening right now within this kind of digital and electronic uh, health space. <clears throat> Um, so I'll switch over to another, uh, a third example uh, area where um, I'm personally very involved in, um, and, and we have a lot of uh, work in this. So uh, there's, you know, next generation cryptographic techniques. You've probably heard of uh, homomorphic encryption, and um, uh, there's another thing called multi-party computation. And basically, uh, these techniques allow you to um, s sort of uh, factor out uh, what used to be uh, things that you assume have to go together. So you assume that if you want to uh, take uh, data from multiple organizations and do some kind of joint computation over it to analyze it, you know, um, you would assume that you need to actually share that data, give it to some party, and then it'll do the computation. Um, it turns out with techniques like multi-party computation and homework encryption and so on, you can actually separate computation from, uh, being it, from actually being able to read and hold the data. I can, for example, encrypt my data, give it to some kind of service provider. They do the analysis without ever seeing the data or the results. They give me back the encrypted results. I decrypt the results, and I look at them. So these things are all, <clears throat> are all possible. But these are not techniques that are currently being used in production, you know, in, in the real world. Um, and one of the things that we uh, currently have is a bunch of uh, grants 
from the National Science Foundation as well as other partners that are explicitly um, uh, you know, for building open source libraries that will then allow others to build applications and services on top of these open source libraries to introduce these kinds of features into their applications. So here we have a list of different libraries and some there's other talks that you'll hear um, during this conference about some of these like for example Conclave as well as the applications uh, where they're being used but we're essentially being funded by NSF to build libraries that are open source and uh, that can be uh, sort of deployed and used within applications and <clears throat> excuse me we've actually been able to uh, uh, to take some of these and and uh, deploy them which I'll mention in a second now one thing that one approach that we've taken here when we when we started this is there are a lot of libraries obviously being, being pulled, put together within this community by uh, researchers um, you know faculty members uh, graduate students but one of the approaches that we took when we uh, started uh, building some of these part in particular because we knew we needed to deploy them we, need, we knew we needed to deploy them for applications that are going basically basically going to run at the uh, you know on browsers that end users are using on their uh, you know uh, laptops and, and so on uh, we actually had to from scratch build them using you know JavaScript for example so that they run on all the browsers and that you can build applications that are compatible on all browsers um, so this is, in a, this is a library called JavaScript uh, implementation of federated functionalities that we built uh, to support those kinds of environments. And there's lots of demos online that you can look at. Um, and you kind of see these libraries from a few slides ago, um, sort of where they went uh, uh, or where they're going now. So we have collaborations with uh, the city of Boston, the Boston Women's Workforce Council, where these libraries were actually used to build applications that have been deployed over the past uh, three years or so uh, in production, used by um, hundreds of companies across Boston, where uh, you know they're um, basically loading this application in the browser and contributing data to a computation in a privacy-preserving way. Uh, we have a partnership with Honda Research Institutes, and uh, this is to Honda Research Institutes' credit uh, that it actually uh, is supporting uh, open source develop development. So they're funding this work, but they're, they're funding open source libraries that they hope to benefit from as well. Um, and uh, we've actually built uh, uh, prototypes and demos of things like, um, so let's say you have uh, Google's routing service, right? So Google allows you to say, I'm here, I want to go there, and it returns to you uh, sort of a path uh, of how to, how to get to that destination. So you can actually build that service in a way such that Google never sees your query. It doesn't know where you're starting and it doesn't know where you're going. Nevertheless, it's able to tell you how to get there. Um, so you can do this in a privacy-preserving way using uh, these techniques and using these kinds of libraries that, that we've put together. Uh, we've been fortunate uh, to work with the Callisto project as well. Uh, we've put together some libraries that allow them to use uh, multi-party computation techniques within their service. Callisto is a sexual assault reporting um, uh, service that runs on a number of campuses right now, and they're building sort of a next-generation version version of their, uh, of their offering that is going to use some of these next generation cryptographic techniques um, and, and we were able to put together some open source libraries thanks to the NSF funding uh, for them as well. And as I mentioned, you'll hear about Conclave, uh, um, which is another project that involves the Massachusetts Open Cloud, uh, Dataverse, and actually Red Hat I think is involved in this as well at this point. Um, and it's a very interesting project. You'll hear more about it in, in subsequent talks, but um, one of the libraries there is, is again something that we've been working on funded by NSF uh, that contributes to this project and allows uh, these kinds of privacy preserving uh, computations to take place uh, within cloud, <coughs> cloud environments. Um, so uh, the last topic I'll kind of talk about is uh, urban data science. So uh, uh, BU um, hosts something called the Initiative on Cities, which was, uh, I think, started by the former mayor. Um, and uh, the initiative uh, tries to connect uh, researchers and students um, at Boston University with uh, cities, in particular the city of Boston, but also other cities in the area, uh, to sort of address issues. And what's interesting over the last you know, three to four years, uh, maybe even more so sort of two to three years, um, is cities have started to uh, embrace uh, open data, right? So they basically take all the data that used to be uh, in, you know, document, paper form, uh or just going into a black hole or some server somewhere and, and never looked at again. And they've been taking them and, and turning them into these open data portals that uh, are accessible to everyone. So right now you can go online, you can go to Analyze Boston and you can see, you know, here's all the bike paths in Boston, here are all the 311 calls, here are all the 911 calls, here's where all the accidents happen. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, so far it, it, it's a difficult challenge for uh, cities to uh, actually go beyond that because they don't really have the resources to then take that and build solutions based on that data. They're just trying to get the data out there. 
Um, but they are using sort of open source frameworks like CCAN and Socrata API to do that. Um, but what we've been doing is, uh, for example, supporting um, uh, uh, student kind of project-based courses, as well as other projects that are funded by NSF, um, to uh, build tools that use that data or, or to build tools that allow others to use that data. So we have this kind of this diagram of this ecosystem, various little components that will allow someone to take, you know, if I have the bike path data set from the city of Boston, can I take that and then, for example, find the most efficient way to connect the bike paths? Where could I place additional bike paths to sort of uh, connect them up and have them uh, have better continuity? So in order to do that, you have to retrieve the data, you have to store it somewhere, you have to build a pipeline that maybe can retrieve updated versions of that data over time. Uh, <clears throat> and what you need to do is uh, then maybe run an optimization algorithm over it. But that requires converting that data from whatever, you know, GIS format or uh, uh, sort of open street map style format it's in to something that's going to be compatible with, uh, you know, network hex in Python or something like that. So uh, we've built a lot of libraries and, and sort of tools to support that kind of thing. And students have been able to contribute as well as use those kinds of tools within courses that uh, are offered at BU, where they use these open data sets uh, and, and they do projects, uh, you know, focused on uh, sort of solving problems with optimization techniques uh, and sort of statistical analysis techniques. We've been able also to do it ourselves in a couple of cases. Recently, uh, Boston had um, uh, uh, the Boston Public Schools had a challenge to uh, find a better way to route school buses to reduce costs. It was a little controversial. Uh, we were careful to not get into the controversial part of it. We actually just what we did was we offered uh, to create uh, uh, an anonymized sort of uh, uh, data set that is representative of, of the distribution of students in the Boston area, but is not actually the addresses of all the children in the Boston area. Uh, um, and we did that by essentially taking a collection of different open uh, data sets um, and using a bunch of tools to, uh, to build something that has the same distribution in terms of the number of students going to number of schools. And you have to get it right. So if you see on the picture on the left here, that just connects every student with a straight line to the school that they attend. In the Boston area, for example, because of the way that uh, Boston assigns students to schools, you see there's a lot of uh, cross traffic north to south there. So it's, it's not, not terribly efficient in terms of transportation, but you have to kind of create something that's representative of the actual challenges uh, that um, uh, the routing uh, you know, algorithms might face if they're actually going to figure out how to uh, transport all these students. So this was a, an opportunity to use some of these tools, use some of these data sets, and for us to kind of get involved in a project that um, uh, uh, you know, hopefully at least provided a beneficial data set that others could use to do the, the actual routing challenge. So full disclosure, MIT won the challenge for routing, um, although, again, you can read the newspaper articles to see what the controversy was there. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted uh, to kind of now step back from uh, these specific topic areas and just kind of um, uh, demonstrate some of the ways in which um, by doing all of these things, uh, certainly the Software and Application Innovation Lab at BU has been able to find opportunities to um, uh, reuse and uh, also leverage uh, our experience working in one area uh, uh, to uh, basically you know, inform or, or give us something that we can reuse or, or have an advantage in, in another area. So it's just like, uh, we call it the spider diagram sometimes. Some of the projects that we've worked on, some of the tools that we've used to support those projects in particular areas of research. And you can group them in various ways, but this is sort of uh, just one way of grouping uh, some of these projects. So just to give an example, um, one thing that we've, uh, we've been able to do is uh, build um, a backend uh, system that we've reused throughout projects. The backend system basically does things like user management, authentication, um, and you can you know, uh, manage data. But we've been able to, to use it for these computerized adaptive testing platforms. We've been using it, we've been able to use it for synthetic biology databases. Uh, uh, we've been able to use it for sort of situations where you need to build um, tools that, uh, uh, you know, are HIPAA compliant. Uh, and by taking this open source platform that, again, we've seen people rebuild over and over again, um, uh, building our own kind of version of it on top of open source frameworks, making it open source, we've actually been able to uh, save a lot of effort on our part, and we've been able to take features that uh, benefit one community and and sort of transfer it to another community. And people are starting to accept it. They're starting to understand that, oh, it's OK that um, you know, I'm going to uh, fund an improvement to this open source uh, project uh, and you know, save some of my funding for the actual work uh, of the research, rather than build the whole thing top to bottom and, and sort of own everything, uh, which doesn't really benefit anyone because, you're, again, you're just rebuilding the same kind of back end from scratch each time. <clears throat> um, front ends as well, we've kind of uh, embarrassingly reused front 
front-end uh, frameworks and components across projects that are vastly different, you know, um, uh, and yet we've been able to sort of reuse this stuff um, and, uh, and, you know, again, save effort, um, get benefits uh, of, of feature improvements across these projects um, in these kinds of uh, scenarios. And then um, just sort of from a competitive advantage standpoint, right, so the, one of the reasons the Herrera Institute exists at Boston University is to make it possible for researchers to be more competitive when they apply for external funding to NSF, to NIH, and places like that. Um, and <clears throat> um, among the things that you need to have there is, you know, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, <clears throat> so one of the things that you um, you would benefit from uh, is uh, you know you have built frameworks before you've worked on uh, you've used best practices before and you're able to reuse those um, and, and say I can reuse this in a project if the NSF funds it um, or I'm able to do a new uh, ask a new kind of question because I ran into it while working on these uh, on these kinds of projects so I talked about a little uh, the digital health projects before where we were able to take things that we're familiar with from software engineering and kind of bring you know frameworks and best practices into these communities and uh, and build all these tools with all these collaborators and, and so sort of that's great but many of these for example require HIPAA compliance so then we can say okay well we have familiarity with that because we do cybersecurity research we do this sort of next generation cryptography research we can actually take some of these techniques and bring it into these projects uh, and now we can you know maybe use a slightly more sophisticated form of encryption to manage sort of multi multiple layers of users and, and the way that they can uh, have access to different components so you know we can uh, bring that into the frameworks because that we have experience with that uh, of course also builds our own sort of experience the experience of our interns and so on uh, as we do that but then you can actually turn around and go back and say now that I'm in this community I actually um, am introduced to new problems that I haven't seen before uh, because I'm familiar with all these members of this community and now I can actually go back to NSF and say they actually would benefit <clears throat> from additional kinds of work in cybersecurity and cryptography that hasn't been done yet but that we could do and then they would be able to use and then you can go back to NSF and say We'd like to do this work. Please, you know, please fund it. Uh, it'll require some basic research, but then it'll also require us to do the software engineering to, to put it into production and have patients actually be able to use these features. And we've been able to do that with some partners like Hey Charlie is a is a startup that actually uh, tries to address the um, uh, recidivism in opioid uh, addiction and, and help uh, patients not uh, sort of uh, uh, return to their uh, bad habits. And, and one of the things that we were able to do for them is build build this kind of uh, encrypted backend that allows them to analyze uh, and store data without actually having to to store sensitive data about patients uh, and, and um, sort of their histories and so on. Um, other examples we've been able again to uh, to, to uh, allow students within these urban data science projects to use the Massachusetts Open Cloud, for example, as well as uh, sort of efficient uh, frameworks for doing uh, big data computations um, in these kinds of environments. And then, again, as a result of us being able to go to the city of Boston or the collaborators and say, here, we've you know, helped you with something, they come back and they trust us to tell us you know, problems. Because if you go, you know, usually if a researcher goes to like the city of Boston and says, we'd like to work with you on something, they're like, who are you? I, I've never worked with you before. I don't really trust that if some of your students uh, uh, learn about my problem that they're going to come back a year later or a few months later and actually solve it. <clears throat> but by actually do, doing something first and building a relationship, you actually get to talk to people and they tell you what their real problems are. And that's how some of our uh, some of this multi-party computation uh, uh, deployment work happened as a result of the fact that we already had relationships uh, with the city of Boston based on previous previous engagements. And then that goes back into again uh, allowing us to ask for funding to do research in cybersecurity, cryptography, and so on <clears throat> for things like uh, multi-party computation. <clears throat> um, sorry, I did not plan to get sick. Um, all right, so anyway, um, so that hopefully gives you an idea of, of, of the way that we've been able to uh, leverage the fact that we are using uh, software engineering uh, practices and, and sort of open source techniques uh, to enrich uh, the research community at BU and to um, sort of find new opportunities uh, both for researchers as well as for uh, introducing software engineering and open source best practices um, into, into these communities. Um, and um, and again, I, I want to I you know, pause and say there's a lot of other things going on at BU. This is just a small slice of things that we've been involved in. Um, there's a lot of things going on at the School of Engineering. There's a lot of things going on. Um, 
um, even even within the Harir Institute that I haven't mentioned that again you'll hear in other talks um, and uh, and I hope you you do attend those talks and, and hear about those other um, those other uh, topic areas but so that's uh, us we're the Nation lab um, and these are some of our sources of funding now here from these external agencies and other partner organizations um, that fund the, the sort of the majority of our work um, and uh, thank you very much for uh, sort of uh, listening to what's going on at BU hopefully it gives you a better idea of, of what's happening and also a better idea of the opportunities uh, that you have to engage with the academic community um, uh, around some of these uh, areas as well as uh, many others. So thank you very much. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Andre. That, that, that's really great. I appreciate the, uh, appreciate the talk. Uh, I forgot to mention one thing, which is that in this room here is the uh, Red Hat Boston University Collaboratory Track. All of the talks in this room today will be presented by interns from BU who have been working with us over the summer. So please be sure to check those out if you find them interesting. Uh, we got a coffee break now, so get some coffee. Enjoy it. Enjoy this stuff. We're paying for it. <laughs> and thank you.